welcome to Ask the Educator, a podcast brought to you by Healthmark Industries. Are you a sterile processing technician or manager? Maybe you work in infection prevention or biomedical engineering. Whether you're a frontline tech, endoscopy tech, OR nurse, or surgical services administrator, you undoubtedly have influence in medical device processing at your facility. In each episode, we speak with experts from the Healthmark Clinical Affairs team, industry leaders, or special guests from the trenches to answer your questions and bring you relevant industry information, equipping you for excellence in medical device processing. My name is Kevin Anderson, and I will be your host. Now let's get started. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Ask the Educator. This is uh, Kevin Anderson, your host, and with me I have Adam as my co-host. And joining us again as our as our kind of guest of honor, if you will, is John Whalen, because we're just trying to plug through and really give you an overview of ST91. So, John, with this episode, we wanted to, you know, give people an idea about these appendices in the back or annexes, I guess is the better term. What are they? Why are they there? Are they part of the standards? Are they not part of the standards? Like, what do we need to know about these annexes? Because all I can say is I found some pretty useful information, at least in ST79. I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of useful information in there for ST91 as well. Thanks. And uh, it's good to see you guys again virtually. Um, It's the annexes in ST91 aren't standard language, meaning you are not obligated to the information, but many times in the course of developing ST91, as you guys remember, we would get to parts of the discussions where we said, well, that doesn't really need to be a shall or a must or a should, but it's information people need to have. So it's value added information that's there. And it was information that was available that's based on current best practice information, as well as guided by currently available information from clinical investigations, research industry, et cetera. Does that, do you think it helps describe it well enough, guys? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not necessarily part of the standard, but it's supporting information that's useful or helpful in making these decisions. And speaking of those decisions, I think we're going to go ahead and just run through the list here of the annexes in ST91. And one of the first ones we're going to look at is Purchase considerations when you're selecting AERs and liquid chemical sterilants machines. So why is that one, the purchase considerations, why is that in the annex? Well, because uh, at the end of the day, there's more that should be going into it other than just the price of it and whether it fits in your department. So yes, we speak to cost considerations, physical footprint, but is this a device that has FDA clearance and can you prove that? Is it compatible? You need to consider compatibility with the scopes that you have in inventory. What about any consumables that go along with it? Yes, you can buy a shiny new car, but if you have to have all these consumables that go along with it, that you have capital costs and you have operating costs and the consumables go into operating costs. What other devices other than scopes can you potentially reprocess in these machines? So some AERs will take esophageal dilators, for example, some you can get inserts to do TEE probes or vaginal ultrasound probes. So you need to see what options exist for other devices too. And then very seriously, what facility requirements will be needed and can you meet those requirements, meaning plumbing, electrical, HVAC, data, and do you have that already existing or will you need to have those costs added in too? Just like you would buy anything else, but especially in healthcare, what's the expected frequency of PM servicing? And who's going to do that? Will it be your facilities, your clinical engineering people, or will you be signing a contract for PMs and servicing? Yeah, I think that's a great little summation of that one. And, you know, when it comes to AERs, maybe not so much with liquid chemical sterilization units. I'm not aware of too many out there, but AERs, there's a lot out there and there's a lot to consider, as you mentioned. So hopefully that will be a great annex resource for people out there. But what about the next one? It's a reference material for repairs. I feel like this is a very much needed resource for people in the industry. So I think it's important that we included this in the annex because as we all know from having worked 
in facilities, not a lot of thought's been given beyond what individuals have considered when it comes to devices routing in and out of facilities. So people have taken for granted that they send a scope out for repair, it gets repaired, comes back, and then they reprocess it and use it again. But there should be more to the thought process than that. And also, if you get a loaner scope in in its place, what should you be considering? So this was to put some food for thought out there when it comes to both your scopes going out for repair and loaner scopes coming into the facility. What are the owner and the user responsibilities? Things like what are the qualification considerations for repair providers? Are you using original equipment manufacturer, the endoscope manufacturer, are you using a third party? And what about the loaner scopes that route around the country to various places and have they had culturing done at any point in time? If they have, that information should be shared with anybody that uses that scope down the road. So I think some of those are things that people haven't necessarily had on their radar, but really should. Yeah, that's a great point on the repairs and especially with those loader scopes, because again, they they go all over the place. And if there is that kind of information, I think that would be really helpful. So a uh, very important IMX there. How about um, one of the things that I really like to see was the manufacturer's written instructions for use and conflict management. So talk a little about what that means, the conflict between IFUs. Yeah, so it's not uncommon to run into it where you're trying to get an answer of how to do something. So you go to the manufacturer of the device that says one thing. You go to the manufacturer of a process, be it a detergent, a disinfectant, an AER, whatever it is, and you get conflicting information. So how do you proceed? Who's, whose answer do you take? And we talked about prior to purchase considerations. We talked about the need to review against national standards and guidelines, not just the manufacturer's instructions for use, but reference what, what's currently said in standards and guidelines. And then considerations for when you communicate with each manufacturer. What should you expect? You should always expect something in writing because you'll need at the end of the day to prove why you did what you did. And so you should always ask for and ideally receive uh, something in writing in order to prove um, that you got it, if you will, from the horse's mouth. And that's what you're basing it on. Yeah, there's a lot of things that can be frustrating about processing, whether it's flexible endoscopes or anything else. But running up against IFU conflict management is is one of those frustrations. So another great annex there as a resource for people. But another one is, uh, and I could have used this when I, back when I was managing an endoscopy area, we were probably, I'm guessing, one of the first ones to try and institute a borescope inspection. Wow, did that become very difficult very quickly when we're looking down these scopes for the first time and really don't know what to expect. So is that kind of what we're addressing here with the annex uh, that talks about endoscope visual inspection? Yep, it is actually. And and as we all know, uh, one of the common things we hear when we talk about boroscopic inspection of any device, including flexible endoscopes, is people saying, how do I know what I'm looking at? I've not done this before. I don't know what normal is, and I don't know that I could pick up abnormal. So this is one more addition to visual reference to show with pictures, methods, areas to consider when inspecting for damage, moisture retention, et cetera, basic anatomy of an endoscope, process considerations when you establish enhanced visual inspection, which includes boroscopic inspection, inspection of components. So a lot of input was given by people that are in the field of endoscope repair, the people that do it, if you will, for a living. Yeah. And then a really important one there, because we know that there's a lot of issues with the inside of the scopes not being looked at. So visual inspection is huge. How about the user verification of cleaning processes? That's one of the annexes. What is the reason behind that one? So we speak to cleaning verification testing, and in ST91, as we remember, the guidance is for high-risk endoscopes, they receive cleaning verification testing every time they come down the line. For non-high-risk endoscopes, they still receive it, but the facility determines the frequency with which that is performed, and we give recommendations for what to consider in determining that frequency. 
So we speak in the annex to the options for cleaning verification testing. So the examples are protein, carbohydrate, hemoglobin, ATP. Considerations when selecting between as far as which one you're going to pick. We also talk about verification tests for ultrasonic cleaners and mechanical washers because depending on the site, for example, an SPD area, it's we're not just talking about manual cleaning and doing cleaning verification after that, but there's other devices to consider. And then we give example for a cleaning verification program, what that could look like. Excellent. Yeah, that is a that is a huge topic, I think, where uh, people kind of can easily get confused with it. So what about this one? We have another annex here uh, just going down the list, and it talks about the effects of some methicone on flexible endoscopes. This is something that I remember uh, docs using back when I was in the endoscopy suite. And I know that it worked really well for making the diagnostic tool of you know, actually performing the colonoscopy, it it made it kind of easier to visualize uh, the walls of the colon. But what does that kind of do to the to the flexible endoscope? What do we need to know? Yeah. So with this annex, we took the opportunity to summarize, if you will, where things are at in the current state based on clinical investigations and research. So speak to what it is, what is semethicone and why is it used as as you were alluding to there, Kevin, it's given down the scope to break up bubbles, if you will, so you can visualize better, not uncommonly in an upper endoscopy procedure, but even in lower endoscopy procedures, it's used. And it was not uncommon for many years that we just put it in the water bottle that was attached to the scope. And all day long, you know, we irrigated with uh, water with semethicone in it. And it took, uh, again, boroscopic inspection with research that showed that semethicone gets left behind even after manual cleaning and high-level disinfection. It remains in the channels of endoscope, so it's not water-soluble. So that's why it's a concern. It's not getting removed. And if anything is over top of part of the surface of the channel, there could be bio-burden, biofilm underneath that. It's not effectively clean or high-level disinfected. So we summarize in this annex to what the statements, current statements are by standards organization and endoscope manufacturers related to the caution in using it. We know it's still used, and I, I think it's going to be until one of us gets famous by creating a water-soluble replacement for it, but we're not there yet. And there is research and development underway trying to develop alternates, but we're not there yet, so... Yeah, fantastic uh, annex on that one. A lot of information about studies that have been done, uh, things that have happened with semethicone as far as infections associated with them, things like that. So I think a much needed one there. And then that kind of brings us to endoscope microbicidal methods. Can you speak a little bit to that one? So with that one, we gave a chart comparison for microbicidal activity where we cross-reference the different high-level disinfectants, low-temperature chemical sterilants and sterilization methods to better inform people so they can make their institutional risk assessment discussions and decisions about where they're going to head. Because as we know, as a document, we're saying that we need to move forward. We move need to move in the direction of better coverage, and that being in the current state, a move towards sterilization eventually. But what we're doing is we're giving more information for people to make their current risk assessment decisions and discussions with the currently available technologies until we get new or additional technologies that don't currently exist. And again, there's still a lot of research and development underway to come up with alternate methods other than just HLD by AER or low temperature chemical sterilization. Yeah, great summary there. The next one is the endoscope storage risk assessment. So I, I'm thinking about this and I'm like trying to jar my own memory about this one. Does this have to do with, you know, like hang time or does this have to do with actually selecting a storage solution for your endoscope? So what, what is this one about? Yeah, so this is one that we want people to pay attention to because as we know from firsthand experience and from the travels we do around the country that it's still not uncommon to walk into a facility and find a vertical hanging storage cabinet without any air blowing into the cabinet, just passive airflow. 
And we know that scopes need to be dried. There's a lot of emphasis in the new ST91 on active drying even after the AER prior to storage or as part of storage. So within this risk assessment, we need to consider what is the current state? Is there residual fluid in, in the channels of our scope or is there moisture on the external surfaces? How are the scopes stored? Are they stored as per manufacturer instructions, as per standards and guidelines recommendation? Are they stored vertically or horizontally? And what's the difference with that? Do you have a means for tracking each endoscope to a given patient, including the last episode when it was high-level disinfected? It does include hang time, if you will, the storage expiration. And what about the surfaces of the physical space of the storage cabinet itself? Is the actual scope itself tagged and identified as being post high level disinfected and patient ready? Are the doors kept closed of a storage cabinet? One of the banes of the existence for the roll top cabinets that we had in a few of our clinics way back when was humans leave the door open all the time. It's like leaving a garage door open after you park the car. It's a lot easier to get in and out if you leave the door open. Well, that's not good for flexible endoscopes that are patient ready. So yeah, it goes over a lot of different considerations that way, Kevin. Yeah, and then you and you mentioned another important thing about drying with the endoscope drying. I think that brings us to our last annex that we're going to talk about today on the drying assessment or the drying annex. What? How does that help uh, users to sort of interpret what that means? Because I think a lot of endoscopy users are confused about the dry. How do I verify something is dry? How can I look inside my scope and know that it's dry? It's really impossible to do, right? But there are tools and there are things in the annex that talk about that. Can you speak a little bit to what we can do as far as verifying things are dry? Yep. So within the standard itself, we re do recommend that scopes are actively dried, even post AER, and that they're dried prior to reuse, clinical reuse, or before storage, if you have a conventional cabinet with just air blowing into the cabinet, or as part of a drying cabinet operation, gone should be the days of an MA or a tech standing there waiting for the AER cycle to finish only to lift the lid and pull out the scope so they can take it right to the procedure room. You want to create a process that's sustainable, consistent, standardized, such that if it gets interrupted, if a procedure is delayed, for example, it only takes minutes for biofilm to develop. So we're going to actively dry scope. So we give the importance of drying, a literature review, current updated literature review, a table reference to related studies. And then, Adam, as you were talking about drying verification, the entirety of ST91 is geared around embedding quality control in every step of the process. So how would you do that with drying? There's cards that react to moisture that's present as it's blown onto the card. There's pro uh, not probes, there's um, swabs. Help yeah, me out, guys. There you so go. Swabs, sorry. Swabs that you can put down a channel and you, and you put the swab tip into a vial and check for a color change. This isn't necessarily something you need to do every time, but periodically you should test that the drying that you're doing is effective, just like you would test anything else. If you're assuming that's a problem because you don't know if what you're doing, even if you're using a drying cabinet or active drying prior to storage, you should periodically test to make sure it's working correctly. Excellent, John. Thank you so much for uh, just running through all these annexes uh, with us. There is a lot there, but we really wanted to just allow you to kind of speak to all this stuff because these are really good resources. And, you know, I, just speaking from my own experience, when I was in the field and managing departments, I, I was going right to what does the standard <laughs> guidelines say? I didn't even know that there was helpful annexes back there. So we're just trying to do our part to, you know, bring some awareness to this because the annexes are getting better and better each iteration of a, a standard and guideline that comes out. And these things are so helpful. And we've got pictures too, Kevin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> the pictures. The, the pictures are very, very important, especially in, you know, the, the realm of inspection and all of that. So it, it's a great resource. Wanted to draw some attention to it. So thanks so much for going through it with us. And thanks, Adam, for helping me out as always. And uh, hope you guys enjoy it and continue to subscribe and listen to the podcast.
All opinions expressed on this show are those of the presenters. Before using any medical device, it is important to review the device manufacturer's instructions for use.